Thank you. Right, anyway, so yeah, project project two. So as as you'd all well be aware now is that we've got three projects that we're working on for planning approval. So it's exactly the same three projects of what's been working worked on for building approval. Our to summarise our three projects are a, a single detached residence for project one, this multi residential project for project two, and a multi story office complex for project three. So with project two in planning, you'll find that it's very similar layout and process as per project one. One thing that will be, well, apart from the building type and building classification, one thing that will that's distinctly different from this project from the first project is that this project requires far more um, involvement with aspects of compliance. So disabled access, fire separation, car parking requirements. And we've got multiple classifications happening in the one project. So our, our first project is very simple in that in that regard. We have just a class 1A building. That's all it's all very, very simple. With this one, we've got a class 2 building, so it's a multi-residential building, and we're creating a class 10 component. So class 10 um, is a non-habitable structure such as car parking, etc. So what we're doing is we're creating that structure, and that structure is being created uh, by by modification of our existing multi-residential property. So by enclosing several walls, we create that class 10 uh, component. So we've got multiple classifications happening with one that um, will have uh, ramifications in terms of fire separation. So if we if we think about it. When we go adding car parking under buildings, we we um, we go adding an element of combustibility, a, a fire source feature to that. So so there so there are more complexities in regards to the the compliance aspects with this one, but that's offset by typically a drawing model which is far easier to work with and and muck around with. There will still be some some elements that you have to get rid of. There are still going to be some some issues that you have. When it comes to adding in details when you do cross sections and whatnot, these are all things things to work through. But in the main, uh, this one's this one's a bit bit easier to work with than, than project one. So our our flow through this project is basically the same as project one, as will be project three. So we start we have a procedure document that guides us about everything that needs to be produced and much of that should be fairly familiar from project one. We get our, our Revit file for existing structure. Um, got information here about filing protocol, etc. Um, then we start off doing task one project requirements. So that same initial investigation of the project and site as you did with project one, you're doing that with project two and no surprises you'll be doing that with project three. So we start exactly the same way doing that, that research. So if you're quite successful with, with doing project one, use that uh, with your um, project requirements of project one, use that as your template for doing, for doing project, project two. Obviously different location, different, uh, different council, some different aspects in, in terms of, well, there's, there's no, no bushfire attack level. We're in, we're in a, an urban area. Oh. Um, uh, Okay. Um, then following that up, you've got to do your desktop research. So same as with project project one, you had to do the desktop research. So project two, doing the same. There should be nothing really new in this in this regard, except for yeah, except for those changes that I outlined. So we won't have to go into any of that that stuff again. Um, however, what you what you will encounter with with this with this council is that their um, planning approval forms aren't available online as they are with Mitchum. So so with Mitchum you can go in there, you can get get those those forms still as a PDF. This particular council and and I'm, I imagine this is going to be be more and more and more of a thing um, is that a, approval applications are going to be electronic only. So when we get to that point, I can give you all 
the planning approval form. So I've got the old ones in a, in a PDF form. I can give them, give them to you for, for inclusion like that. I just have to see that you've gone through that process of finding where they are. So, so when, it, when it comes to, to doing, the, doing the planning approval forms, all you have to do is submit your screenshot showing this is how I got there and this would be my first, first bit to, to fill out. I'm satisfied with that and then I can provide you with those, those forms for moving, moving on. Um, whatever you do, don't go through and start an application, start filling these, these things out on, online because this is, this is an actual address um, and I don't, don't want... The council there are aware that we use this, this, this subject property um, but I don't want any application for, for, for any development approval. Um, then you'll go through that, that process of uh, the task force uh, reports request, so you, so you do, do that quiz, um, use that same process you did for task one, and then, then you get some reports as well. One thing, uh, from, from memory, one thing that you'll get is your landscaping. Oh, actually, no. I think maybe that's project three. You get your landscaping at this point in time, which ends up ends up being your your site plan. What I've what I've just so I've just gone into the the Revit Revit model. It's not allowing me to to bring up floor plans and site yet. So so I'll I'll have to have a look at that as to as to why that is why why that is the case at the moment with this. I'll possibly yeah. Um, no, it's still not showing it. So when yeah, when I'm not presenting, I can I can have a look to see where we're getting that that site plan from. But um, but what I just right click zoom to fit. Right click zoom to fit. Oh great. Okay. Yep. So and site. Site showing up there. Okay, yeah. So we, we have our have our site. Fantastic. So all those elements are are then are then in the in the site plan. But what? Well, actually, I'll go go back to our our. Well, I'll shrink this one down. We won't be needing needing that one now. So go go back to our PDF of what's what's required and and show our, our client brief. So your client requires an apartment block to be converted to allow disability access to the upper floor and, and a disability access apartment created by converting two apartments into one apartment. Yeah, not a, not a highly likely scenario in, in terms of that. That's basically directly the opposite of what developers like to do. You know, normally the name of the game is maximise your accommodation, maximise your, your returns. But Let's just say, you know, our client has has a disabled parent or so that they want to accommodate in their in their project to provide them with, with um, um, ongoing going place to live. So so that's what will be what will be happening. You've got got this um, block of apartments, which I'll show here on the on the Revit model. Let's uh, so that's our that's our block of apartments there. Car parking underneath, and uh, and four, uh, what is it? Four apartments on level one. One, two, three, four apartments. So yeah, it's not. By no means a fantastic design. I would not design an apartment block like that myself. Um, a lot of how to say it. A lot of lot of space. A lot of um, building that, which isn't really being used, utilised to its to its maximum potential, but anyhow, that's that's what we what we have. So the the intention is to remove a wall, remove one of the walls here, to make a double apartment and make it um, compliant with, with disabled access. Um, focus on door widths, access from lift, bathroom size, and layout. So you're going to have to be dealing with disabled bathrooms. Now that's that's actually really quite, um, I guess it's quite, it, it can be something that can be really simplified in both AutoCAD and Revit as 
as you're probably all well aware, there are certain clearances that are required within a bathroom in, in terms of um, those, those circulation spaces to enable activities to happen. Um, given all of those, those constraints, you can go, go, all right, this is our standard bathroom that works. And these are the these are the clearances. We can impose that that bathroom, and that that's a very very simple approach, and that can work, and that's definitely um, the standard approach for when you're building something something new. You go right. We've got this bathroom layout. That that's a family in Revit. Pop it pop it in, and that's probably more the approach you're going to be using with Project Three, by the way. But also there's the opportunity to work through that bathroom and go. How can I make this bathroom work really well with our existing plumbing, save, save, on, save on money so we're not doing major changes and things like that? How can I make this, this bathroom work? So it's sort of your opportunity to actually work through um, uh, the, the relevant Australian standard and, and sections of the NCC to, to do that design. Um, also, I'm, I'm not sure how well this space is filled professionally at the, at the moment. But certainly, when I was when I was doing doing work for the engineering firm, we actually this act was actually quite a lot of our work. There was um, because you have you have an existing building stock that requires some modification, it requires planning approval. Whenever you put in planning approval or building rules consent for, for modification of a building, you have to bring those buildings up to scratch with current legislation. Current legislation is that you have to provide access to all um, areas intended by use for the general public. So, so let's say let's say we've we've got an RSL hall that that has to have a new kitchen put in. If we put that new kitchen in, then we also need to put disabled access ramps to the front door, etc. Make sure that that whole building can can meet those those requirements that we have disabled access through the whole area. Which will include a disabled bathroom as well. So, so even even minor modifications, minor works, things that you'd think that you know we're just doing the kitchen. Um, once once you do that, then you have to bring all these these other things up to spec. So there's actually a lot of work in this field. It's a it's a very handy thing for you to have understanding of, to have have under your belt because from from my understanding at the moment it is. Well, it's, years ago, it was certainly fairly underserviced in, in terms of people who, who were doing this. Um, so, yeah, so there's that, and also, also in, in terms of um, access and egress in, in relation to fire as, as well as one of those other underserviced areas. So, so it's a great opportunity for you to learn learn these things and, and, and work through them. So, focus on door widths. So, we'll be pouring through all of this stuff. In detail, once uh, probably probably next next week we'll like so it'll have to be next Monday because Monday is our our um, external students coming day. But we'll start pouring into these things in detail, so the, the legislation and how and how it all how it all works. But a very important thing for disabled access are door widths and approaches, because yeah, if any, if anybody spent any time in a wheelchair, you realise okay how how did Sure. How difficult it is, you know, to just do one some of these simple tasks like like opening a door. You have to get, you know, right beside it and, and turn, etc. So you have to ensure that there's enough space around those doors for that for that approach. And as you approach a door from one direction, that's that's going to be different than approaching from the other other direction. So you've got to look at look at these things. So so door widths, access from lift. So. Um, we're going to have have a lift in there for for disabled access, but one of the one of the quirks is that, and I think this may actually be be changing soon, um, but but it's still still current is that when when in case of emergency like a fire or something you cannot actually be using a lift. So because we can't be relying on on lift transportation in in emergency, then those stairs still have to be designed. For disabled access in the in the case of emergency. So, so in, in, in this particular project's case, the the amount of space you need for a disabled ramp is a bit is a bit 
much. Right. Whereas the stairs, right. you're only putting them on a chairlift anyway. Right. Yeah, yeah. Be yeah, be that be that as it may. Um, yeah, certainly certainly we're not designing a ramp. We're not we're not you know going. Like what? Well, like a, what's a one in fourteen slope? One in fourteen slope to get yeah yeah. We're not we're not gonna not gonna start at the shopping centre and make our way up to the building um, over several hectares. Um, but we, there are still requirements about disabled access uh, stairs. So it's not just for people in wheelchairs and and chairlifts etc. Up the side certainly make it wide enough for for the possible inclusion of a of a chairlift. Um, that's that's just good design sense. I just don't get why anyone in a wheelchair would want to be on the second floor when if there is a fire, they'd either have to take the actual lift or a stair lift. Both of them, the lift, the actual lift would be a lot faster, but of course because of the fire damage, um, because of possible fire damage, that's why the structure they don't want to just fall and snap. But then the fact that they would put some a disabled person in a wheelchair in somewhere that either has to take a lift either way just seems to be Yeah, so so in that in that instance, um, yeah, it's it's not it's not just the not just the, the risk of, of a of a cable snapping in the event of a fire or so, it's also that the electricity gets gets cut out and that electricity may get cut out at any at any point in time. You can enter a lift, get part way between between floors, electricity cuts out, that's it, lift stops dead, brakes brakes go on. There's you know, there's no way for that for the for the occupants of that lift to get out at that point when they're when they're stuck stuck between floors. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah, that's something I'd have to look into as well. Yeah. So yeah, 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 cool. Um, but yeah, any anyhow, if it's if it's chairlift, yes, electricity goes out. Yes, they're stuck halfway down the stairs, but at least that's not as as catastrophic. You can, you know, with the help of others, get yourself off the chairlift and get out. It's not it's not as as dire a situation. But and it's and basic, but basically what we have to do is. Yeah, I guess it is important to understand the practicalities that arise around it, but mostly what's most important is just understand what the NCC requires. And the NCC says that you do have to have to provide um, disabled access stairs, so stairs designed for disabled access. So this that's not about chairlifts, etc. It's about well I won't I won't give the game away. There are there are additional things that you have to build into your sets of stairs. To make to make them comply. So, and that and that's just it. That's you know, NCC requires that. Whether you know whether you you know work through the scenarios, you go well. That that's a very unlikely scenario, etc., etc., etc. Sort of by the by, we have to do um, what the NCC says to get it through council, to get it through building rules, to to push on, because that's what the client wants. The client wants this this to happen. They want that design, etc. That's what they want. We want to get it through. Um, and yeah, so bathroom size and layout. Also, in the absence of the client, air conditioning system has recently been installed. However, your client is unsure of its position or output. Yeah. Once again, okay, bit of a strange scenario. But you'll you'll see on the Revit model there's there's an air conditioning unit there. What you what you're required to do is specify your own air conditioner. To the building. So this is this is what will work well. You provide some advice to the client saying, this is what will work. This is how this is how we can meet meet those requirements. Also, the lower level garage is to be enclosed on two sides and adequate parking for residents. So, and you're given a clue there, development plan. So development plan will tell you that for for a development you need to have have additional car parking beyond the car parking requirements. Of just the res residents, so um, and allowing for dis uh, disability parking, so AS uh, 1428.1, and yeah, and once again, visit uh, visit a parking development plan to be designed on the plans. So you're going to have to fit that parking in there somewhere. I suggest that's a really good place to start. Think about 
Um, how much how much space is required for each each car park and and work through all of those those requirements while you're also thinking about your access to the building. So as you as you notice, there are no stairs there, none whatsoever. Um, let's assume it used to have an external staircase or whatever. That's that became a structure and town was demolished. However, you arrive at at your scenario for explaining there's no stairs there. The thing is, there are no stairs there because you have to work through that process. Design the stairs. Decide where they're going to go. Do we need only one set of stairs? Do we need two sets of stairs? How is that going to work without, without car parking? So you've got to work through those scenarios and that's where it starts getting a little bit more compliance heavy. Richard, what's, what's that? What's that? There's a car park and you stand and you lift it. <laughs> <laughs> From that, that's the only thing that Exactly the same thing. The only thing, okay. that, the only two things different. Yeah. One thing is you want to split that room in the middle upstairs. Yeah. You've got to make it one whole room. Yeah. Um, and the second thing is your bottom floor has no walls. Yeah. Like yeah, it's the exact yeah. same plan. Okay, well, great. Well, so, okay, so you guys that have done this in compliance, that, that should be relatively straightforward, but there might be new stuff you're coming across uh, as well. Yeah? yeah, because we've done it in compliance, though, there's all like, that problems with being compliance. There's all these regulations and problems everyone else is like that. So, that force you to do it in a specific way. You haven't got that much freedom with that particular design. No, no, you don't, you don't have a lot of freedom. <laughs> Um, but you do well. Actually, no. You do have a you do have a bit of freedom, though. Um, all right, I'll give the game away a little bit. In this, underneath there, there is plenty of space. There's stacks of space, and there there's like four or five options I can think of for how you can enter that, enter and exit that that under underfloor. Space. So, yeah, I guess if you've already gone through so, that, yeah. so we're, because we're because we're putting stairs in, mm -hmm. and the stairs obviously have to be by a safe. Yeah. Does that mean we have to put the walls in as well? Why? Because the walls have to be around the stairs. That's the legal obligation. That's a that's a fire safety thing. It has to be a certain thickness of wall around the fire stairs. Yeah. Okay. So are we putting yeah. those in as well? Not necessarily. So. Possibly, yeah. Okay, I think this is going to get a little bit more complex than what you, what you have done in compliance. So maybe I'll, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll nail down with, with Amory exactly like what you've gone through because there, there are, you know, there, are, as as you know, NCC Australian standards, well, NCC particularly gets a little bit choose your own adventure. Like if you do this, then you can do this and this and this. But if you do this, then you can do this and this. That's that's the way. It should always be read and, and always always understood. Certainly, when you when you start out looking at it, you've got some aspects which are very clear. Okay, this 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 is an easy way to understand it. I want to be getting a little bit more in depth than that, and and so we will be seeing. We will be exploring some some additional options. One of those additional options are. Do those stairs need to be fire isolated? We'll, so we'll, we'll have a look at that. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so we've got we've got those options around um, how we how we enter the um, building, how we circulate vehicles on the site and, and under underneath. We'll also be looking at do we need two sets of stairs? Yeah. It, so yeah, so we'll be going, we'll be pulling things, a little, pulling things apart a little bit more. Well, I, I certainly hope we'll be pulling things apart a little bit more. I expect that that what you've covered in compliance will easily, like obviously, it's going to, it's going to meet compliance. It's going to be easily, easily meet compliance. Is it going to be what best meets what provides the best service to your client and meets compliance? That's that's what I'm hoping hoping we'll explore. So I, yeah. So I couldn't. I can't fail you for going. Oh, this is what we, this is what we're doing. This is all compliant. There we go. Um, it it will do that. I'm hoping we can get a little bit more involved.
than that and explore some some of those some of those scenarios or some of some of those options. Is is an option though to take those rings off the front? It is an option to take those rings off the front. Yeah. Because yeah. do we do it, um, do we have a situation where the property actually sits on the side plane? Uh, yes, you do. Yeah. Um, is the property in compliance is very oddly oddly shaped. Yeah. Okay. So we've got a we've got a different site happening than than what I what I caught a glance of of yours from compliance. You had a had a very large site. Actually, and that's yeah that's another important thing to to point out. So this so the property address the location is number three Kincaid Avenue Henley Beach. If we look at number three Kincaid Avenue Henley Beach. It is a it's a long skinny allotment. And then we look at this site and we go, hey, that's not a long skinny allotment. What we've got is that allotment's been chopped off. Um, and we've got a got a boundary there, and this building is close to that that boundary. What we need is we need to have an address for contextual purposes in terms of you know, an address that comes with the local council, it comes with a wind speed, it comes with topography, it comes with all these things that we that we need, and you need to need to work work through those. But also, what is required is that there are some aspects thrown into this project that will will dictate what you do and make you make decisions that we want to make you make. So that's why you have to rely upon this as your actual site plan. What you'll notice is you research that site, you go, hang on, that site plan is different than our, than our given site here. You get that, it's for location contextual purposes only, and we work on work on our, our site as it's given to us, and we work on the location of our building on the site as it's given to us. But what we will include is adjoining development. So you'll see that adjoining development there on, on whatever geographic information service you use, that adjoining development, you'll be able to measure how how far that is away from your, your boundaries. Put those buildings in there. So as as they're set back from the street, as they're set back from your boundaries, that's the that's the context that you have to have to use, have to place your adjoining development in. So yeah, so then there may be or there will be additional um, things thrown up by this site, they weren't thrown up in compliance. So, uh, so confirmed dimensions, materials, conformity of information stated on specification and reports to compliance and client so you've got to go through that through that process as you did with, with project one. You know, is what the client wants compliant? Are the other reports correct, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so develop your existing class two accommodation model to meet requirements of your site analysis. Um, yeah, any any information you get, notifications, materials selection. So you get to choose some of your materials. So we're we're rented, so this is an existing building. We're making modifications. We're making we're carrying out renovations to it. So you get to choose some of these materials. You get to think, okay, well this is what it is. It's an existing brick building. Looks to be that 1960s, 1970s sort of aesthetic. This is probably the the, the type and colour of bricks we'll be working with. How can we how can we work harmoniously with that in a in a design sense with our materials we we choose? Are we are we going to try to replicate that? Are we trying to going to try to work in concert with it? Demolition. So, so this is the first time you're going to have to start thinking about demolition. What is the process of demolition? What are the impacts of demolition? Do we have to involve Safe Work SA, for example? Do we, you know, are we getting are we getting rid of stuff? How do we tell people on site what to demolish, what what not to demolish, um, and and is it is it going to be safe? So, there's some things you're going to have to think about for that for that demolition. In the main, though, this is very simple in terms of in terms of demolition, um, and so demolition in order to carry out modifications. So access via stairs and lift to upper level. Well, I guess stairs being plural, that maybe maybe directs you in one sense. But I, 
I don't like I want you to be exploring some things. Last last semester I got some great approaches, some really good thinking outside of the box in in that in that regard. So that's cool. Um, and look I, I like it. Um, two apartments to be combined to provide large uh, disability access accommodation. So um, yeah, you'll be knocking down a wall. Addition of uh, two side enclosed uh, oh, addition of two sided enclosed class ten garage under accommodation. So that means that existing car park is underneath, you're enclosing that. Enclosing that on two sides, you get to choose which two sides you enclose it. So you do that, and I'm going to let you remove that honeycomb structure there as well. Give you some flexibility. Yeah, give you some possibilities of, of various different options. So you're going to think about access and egress. So access and egress from the from the street, um, yeah. and also in terms of um, access and egress around the site. Provision for services, so you've got to start thinking about plumbing. So we're going to go into plumbing, we're going to be talking about plumbing now. Possibly we'll end up having a, having a plumber come in on Monday attendance day for you to ask some, some questions specific to this, this project, or later on we can work through AS3500 to, to look, at our, look at our plumbing runs, our layouts, what we'll have to do, think, think about Think about all these things because it's. I think it is an important thing. Yes, we're we're not plumbers. We're not plumbers and electricians. Plumbers and plumbing and electrical has to be carried out by by licensed contractors. But we can still understand how how these things um, can be designed. What we and what space. What sort of space we need to leave for various different different bits and bobs. Um, because what we don't want to do is go through the whole process of design, carry it through. Get the plumber to look at, and plumber goes, can't do it, can't be done. You you really want to you want to avoid that. So so a bit of bit of education here in this regard is important for that for that the early planning stages. Um, so provision of services, and then also of course we'll be pulling apart the development plan to decide, you know, can can we can we sneak this in as compliant development? Can we not sneak it in as compliant development? What are we what are we going to have to do? And, and if it's not compliant development, what sort of um, what sort of level of of non-compliance with, with the development plan are we are we dealing with? Do we get any concessions for it being existing development? Um, so so look at look at that. Work work through that. Think about that. Um, and the rest, you know, develop sheets to meet requirements of planning approval. Uh, 3D view of premises. Um, client. Client name, project title, student details, sheet schedule, very standard. Site analysis, neighbouring structures, services, vegetation, fence, and shadows. So that sort of stuff. Well, you've been dealing with in, in, in project project one. I'm looking at looking at what what services are on on site and what what neighbouring structures are around. Site plan, your usual uh, suspects, contours, dimensions, um, per. Site, site setbacks, north indicator, site access and egress. So I want to see arrows. I want to see arrows pointing in and arrows pointing out. It's you know um, had had a bit before people just provide an arrow but come in this way and that and that's it. You know um, where you know it's both access and and egress. So I want to see see arrows showing showing how people are to move around the site. Um, Floor plan, so probably nothing new there. Dimensions, overall dimensions, uh, wall openings, for example, external doors and windows, uh, rooms of wall thicknesses, internal rooms of wall thicknesses, door clearances. Uh, one thing I will give you the heads up about some of the failings of this Revit model are that the, we've got some weird walls happening in there. Just take take the take the wall thicknesses as as they are so we've got we've got wall thicknesses like this if you if you want to be pedantic about it you look at it and go why on earth do we have reverse brick veneer in this this scenario is that going to is that going to meet um, our fire separation we'll, we'll, we'll cover we'll cover fire separation between units and so on as 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 we move through but there's there's going to have to be a little bit of acceptance of you know, going okay. Well, these are these are our wall thicknesses. Yeah, so these are the requirements we have to meet for fire separation. So just give me the heads up about that. Um, 
But dual clearances, no, very important thing to work through. And I'll give the game away a little bit. Um, you're going to have to be thinking about a lot of dual clearances. So, so work, work through that, that, um, that scenario. Once again, select appropriate standardized doors and windows. There should be nothing really new in that. <coughs> um, elevations, so all your four elevations. Vertical dimensions, including overall height. So, yeah, we've got to think about, um, about you know, our overall height. Of course, um, council are going to want to know about that. But another thing that impacts upon planning approval uh, the size of our windows, the location of our windows, and, and, and things like that. We want we want consistent window head heights, etc. What when once we start getting a meter off the ground, like once we once we an into two story, and we, we start lifting people up more than a meter off the ground, things start to get complex in in terms of having to provide barriers to falls. What we want to ensure at the planning approval stage is that we're not incorporating anything that will give us a headache for building rules consent later on to be meeting those things. So we've got to start thinking about those things at this point in time in terms of balustrading, in terms of protection of, of operable windows at heights, etc. So you're going to have to work, work through that and, and look at what ramifications there are of getting above that metre off the ground. Um, external materials selected. So you've got you've got options there. You've got options to modify the, the materials as they, they are with the existing development. Like, do you want to slap a render on the outside of it, and make it all homogenous or so? No, that's that's very much up to you. Um, and then, of course, provide window direction indicators, etc. Sections. So longitudinal through bathroom, shower, floor trap, stairs, lift. So because we because you've been told to provide a section through through these ones and because because our essentially this is this is where building rule or in all of these aspects building rules consent starts sneaking into our planning consent because if we design if we design a stair and then and we don't consider that you know we don't go through the compliance Aspects of that in the initial design, we go okay. Put a stair there. We're doing our car parks. All right, it's all good. Let's send that off to planning approval. Then, then you send it off to private certifier after you get planning approval. Private certifier says, oh, you've got to provide this and this with the stairs. You have to um, do this, etc., with your with your car parking. All of a sudden, you've got to go back to planning approval again because you're making major modifications to the project. Either planning approval for providing just just an amendment or completely new planning approval when, when council deems that to be a major modification of the initial planning approval. So that's up to them to decide. So you really have to start thinking about building rules of consent at this point in time to make sure you're not going to have those problems down the track. So looking at, well, roof structure, look, that's, that's fair. Roof structure, wall structure, that's, that's fairly, much, fairly much given to you. Now there's not a lot of detail there and also for the for the more pedantic engineering minded people, if you look at that roof structure, you go, look, I don't know of any prefabricated trusses that will span that distance in that depth. You're gonna yeah. But let's say let's say we do have some prefab trusses that can span that distance at that depth. So spend that belief for a bit. Um, got um, so so wall structure we're we're dealing with our with our thicknesses. Etc. Um, floor structure. You've got to think about fire separation, etc. What are we, you know, what are we, what are we doing, doing with this? What have we got? What have we got to work with initially in that? Um, but back to our our longitudinal section through shower floor trap. If we're cutting through a shower floor trap with um, with a section, we're going to have to ensure that we show the correct slope relationships. Because once again, if we haven't gone through that process of calculating slope relationships, etc., then our bathroom layout may actually have to be changed. We don't want to be getting those surprises when we're at building rules consent. We want to cover all those aspects at planning approval. So you're going to have to have to work through 
the, the requirements of slope relationships as, as specified in, in the NTC, and then also through um, the waterproofing details of AS3740. So you're going to have to be working through those to, to meet that, and, and we're going to we're going to have a look at puddle flanges and things. So for those those floor traps, to show how that how that all works. Um, then with your with your stairs, you've got to have a look at the slope relationship of your stairs. You've got to look at any requirements in terms of designing that um, in accordance with disabled access. And then you've also got to fit a lift in there as well. So you're going to have to be providing some details. So, um, so on uh, on on detail sheets from reports provided and or reference to the NCC and Australian standards, including relevant specific clauses. So, so with with um, well with, with Project One, we've, we've done a bit of that anyhow. Um, but with this one, there's obviously there's going to be a lot more reference to um, National Construction Code and Australian standards and. Um, I'm not sure exactly what you covered in, in compliance in, in relation to this building, but there's probably going to be a lot from that subject that if you kept all your stuff, you can you can refer to this. We'll just actually we might as might as well use this as, a, as an opportunity to discuss some of the things you've covered in compliance. So, did you look at what sort of wall linings you have to use in wet areas? No, we haven't. In compliance, we didn't have to use wet areas for this particular building. Yeah. We've done all of the disabled side of things. Yep. Yeah. Um, so and, and the fire safety related to the disabled side, so the staircase, the lift, the um, the bathroom uh, set out. Yep. But we haven't done any of the wall uh, the wall linings or the floor or the wet yep. area stuff. We haven't done anything like that. Yep. Um, and then, yeah, that, that's why I was saying that what I set out is very restricted because of the way it is and the fact that you have to make those fire, uh, the staircase is fire resistant because of that. So other things I won't, won't go into too much. Yeah, but, yeah. Um, that then limits what you sort of can and can't do. Yeah, that certainly does. Um, yeah, I think, yeah, what, what we'll do, um, we'll approach our dissection of this and our and our looking at all of the compliance aspects from from the way that I've suggested we start the design by looking at our car parking, looking at our access and egress, because that re, that primarily relates to all of our dimensions in in a horizontal sense, and and our location and everything. We'll work through all of those all of those things. Then we'll get into into bathrooms, and we yes we we know that we have these constraints around disabled bathrooms. Possibly what you've covered in compliance will directly go straight into this one. It'll be easy. That'll be really straightforward. If that is if that's the case, that's fantastic. May not be. We might have to work through some things and pull some some things apart a little bit because it's going to be in our client's best interest if we can be retaining the plumbing. Where it is, if we can be working within that existing structure and going, rather than you know go getting a quick cut through the concrete slab and or the floor and and you know install new plumbing and do all this sort of work, which is horrible, time-consuming, and expensive work to do, we can work with, with what's what's there. But we'll work through our, our car parking, etc. First, all the access and egress, then have a look at bathrooms. And while we're having a look at bathrooms. We'll go into a lot more detail about wet areas to understand wet areas, what what our considerations are. So things like wall linings, well, that I guess that doesn't essentially matter at a planning stage. If we if we're using if it's water resistant or waterproof, that's you know that's a fraction of a millimeter difference, and well, and then it's another six mil for tiles, etc. But there's 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 not massive dimensional ramifications that come from that. But we should really understand that. It is very important that you go out from this, you know, from this course of study, understanding water, waterproof, water resistant, and your various different products that will enable that. Um, wall and floor water resistance, waterproofing requirements, types and heights. It's also like so for doing that for doing that cross section. Yes, you're going to have to understand uh, floor gradients, floor set downs, and screeds. Um, 
yeah, uh, it's something something I cover a bit in materials and, and methods in in that initial stuff when we talk about concrete slabs about the importance to understand screeds, floor grades, etc. For specifying to the concrete is what sort of set downs we need to have for bathrooms. So notice in this in this situation we have bathrooms that exist. We also have the complexity that with disabled access, you know, as you as you can imagine, we don't want to have shower screens. We don't want to have enclosed showers. We don't want to have have showers with hobs. Does everybody know what a hob hob is? A raised raised portion of a floor to help contain water within within an area. You, you know, you don't want to be in a wheelchair and and have to you know get it into the shower over a hob, right? So so we've got some existing existing things to, to think about. So we'll 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 pull we'll pull that up, that apart because it is very important that you understand those floor gradients, etc., to be able to specify set downs right from right from the get-go. That's something that can't really be modified part way through a project. Um, and then installation of puddle flange. So that's that's about that 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 uh, flange which is there as an interaction to enable drainage of that floor screed into the pipe work to um, to help with uh, um, mold resistance and so on, not providing the right environment for for that. Um, and, and tiling. So stairs, stairs is something you would have covered in compliance. You're understanding slope relationships and stairs, etc. That's all. Yeah, the the other thing we didn't actually do was draw the um, the extra disabled pipe as opposed to the So like the you know, stair lift or the stairs on that would put any of that up. Um, uh, the lift and everything we just sort of just set that there was a lift there. Yeah. We didn't draw that up. And that's yeah. the only difference really between all of the, the disabled compliance stuff is we didn't physically draw it and do it to the proper scale on the plan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, so what you're gonna have to do, yes, you're gonna have to draw cross sections of stairs to, to scale. You're gonna have to include details around handrails, etc., around balustrades, about your one twenty five millimeter sphere. You're gonna have to include all, you're gonna have to spell that out. So you're gonna have to have dimensions that show, yes, we meet the compliance through through dimensioning all these various different aspects. You've got to dimension rise and run of your of your stairs or going and going and rise. Um Going to rise, uh, yeah. Specify width of stairs, and then, and give some give some reason for that as well. Um, and and height of railings, of course. Um, but yeah, but I th yeah, I think there shouldn't be too much that I need to hammer home about. You will understand slope relationships to stairs, the internal stairs, or okay, well, yes, no, no, slope relationships to stairs. Oh, do you all understand uh, slope relationships for staircases? That's something you would have put forward through in compliance? Uh, I do remember that. Yeah. yeah. Oh, Sarah, do you, do you? Maybe I'm not able to understand. Yeah, okay. It's about, about being able to specify what the rise and the run of a stair oh, should be to. Yeah, yeah. okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So we won't have to spend too much time on that. I have to provide a cross section of lift with compliant aspects to be clearly portrayed and supported by specific clauses for the NCC regarding lift time, width, height, lift clearance, button heights, door widths, and access. So I'm not expecting you to draw up in detail lines a lift. Don't worry about that. Um, you're, you're given, you're given, like within, <coughs> within this, the learn page in um, product. Uh, what is it called? The, the section for, for all your various different products and so on. There's some information there about lifts. So that's from JPS lifts. So you can use that. But there, there are other uh, like Coney lift manufacturers, uh, not Schneider, um, Schindler. There's there's various different lift manufacturers that you might want to go with. So, so and there there are some some that advertise apart from JPS. Uh, they advertise under the thing of um, meeting meeting all disabled. Compliance requirements, etc. But yeah, as as with with anything complex, you're going to get those as as Revit families or, or as CAD blocks to be to be dropping into things. That's what I'm expecting you to do. But with that, you're going to have to so lift type. That's going to be fairly simple. 
Um, width and height, well, those widths and heights are going to be already predetermined by your manufacturer. They're going to say, this is our lift, this is our lift that meets these, these requirements. And by, by the way, a lot of, you know, there are, because being disabled access compliant is, is very, very applicable to, to bulk, of, bulk of buildings, that's going to be very simple to find. So with that section, can we just refer them to the manufacturer? Exactly, yep, yep, and that's, that's exactly what I'm wanting you to do. You're not going to have to reinvent the wheel. If you reinvent the wheel in this situation, you run the risk of, of having stuff land on you that you don't, so definitely, by all means. But there's going to, and look, and you mm -hmm. may be lucky enough to, to get a lift manufacturer that, that already specifies heights of lift buttons, says, you know, <laughs> as for AS1428, this, but the height of the buttons is within this range. So you might get that. Or you might not. If you don't, then you have to add that information in, and you or you might say, you know, tactile surface ground indicators or, or something at this location. You may add those, or you may have to find out what they should be to specify them. So, so lift height, width height. That's going to give lift clearance. Um, yeah, button heights, door widths, and access, etc. You're going to have to check these things. Make sure, make sure they do comply, and you've got to got to spell that out for your private certifier or for the council. This is how this is how it meets these things. So 3D view, two external, minimum four internal depending aspects essential for build. So think about, you know, what are the builders going to want to see in inside there to understand what's going on. Hopefully they they should be able to understand everything with the plans. Anyhow, let's but think about some things you might want to show. Um, Obviously, provide a door window schedule, appropriate label for doors. Um, and then, of course, any additional requirements set out by local council. So, a council might tell you, I want to see this, I want to see this. Um, and then, that's that's about the stuff you have, have to submit. So, that's your, that's your checklist. There should be no surprises in that. So, that's, yeah. So, that's our, that's our project two. So, this one's going to be more compliance. Heavy, and so we'll be pulling apart those those aspects. Naturally, you'll be wanting to get all of you'll be wanting to get project one done and cleared as, as much as, as much as possible. But um, yeah, you can also also start start thinking about this and, and working through it. Start preparing some of the other other aspects if you if you're waiting waiting for me to get back to you, waiting for other students to get back to you on stuff. And also for um, so hopefully, hopefully on Wednesday I'll have it have it nailed down exactly who's going to be where at what time for for the um, attendance day for external students, so that you can come in and prepare your questions and, and so have a good look at this and go oh we're going to have to be asking questions about these these plumbing runs or asking questions about disabled access and things like you know yeah possibly a good good question for a private certifier is do these stairs absolutely need to be fire isolated? That's, yeah. oh, sorry, you won't. Yeah, you won't be be here for that. But yeah, <laughs> no, you won't. But, but maybe, maybe, maybe somebody else could. Yeah. But if if there are if that, some of these some of these curly sort of choose your own adventure things are popping up for you, or you think they might be there, yeah, that's that's an opportunity to ask ask people who are professionals in this in this realm to to do that. So. Have, have a good look at it. Have a have a pour through it, um, and then yeah, then we'll we'll go through through each of those aspects.